We're now going to cover the next topic in our overview of Java's key functional programming concepts and features, which will focus on immutable objects. An immutable object is an object whose state remains constant after it's been entirely constructed. After first covering the key concepts associated with immutable objects in Java, we'll then examine a case study that fixes the problems with the buggy factorial example we covered in the previous part of the lesson. This particular example can be found in the EX2 project in my FP folder in my modern Java GitHub repository. Functional programming focuses largely on immutable objects rather than the mutable objects that's the focus of object-oriented programming. An immutable object's state cannot change after it's been constructed. Take, for example, the money class shown here on this slide. The money class contains only final fields, such as m amount and m cur. These fields are initialized in the constructor and can't be changed after they're given their initial value, which is the meaning of the Java final type qualifier. The money class also only has accessor methods, methods that return the values of its fields, such as get concurrency and get amount, returning mcur and m amount, respectively. However, there are no mutator methods that could change the values of its fields, which can't be changed anyway because they're defined as final. Instances of money will behave in precisely the same way throughout their whole lifetime. Therefore, immutable objects are forever, just like diamonds. Java string is a commonly used example of an immutable object that you've likely run across when writing Java programs. All of the fields in the string class are defined as final, such as the value field shown here, and it only defines accessor methods, such as the length method here. After the constructor of string sets the value, the string will behave the same throughout its entire lifetime. Thus far, our focus has been on individual immutable objects. However, modern Java also supports immutable collections of objects, which we'll discuss now. Some new immutable collections were introduced in Java 9, including those returned from the list of factor method, the set of factor method, and the map of factor method. Calling mutating methods on immutable collections is not allowed. In particular, if you try to call the add method on an immutable list, the unsupported operation exception will be thrown. Likewise, null elements are not allowed in immutable collections. If you try to add the null element to the immutable set, you get a null pointer exception at runtime. In addition, immutable collections are thread safe. They can therefore be used in concurrent programs without requiring explicit synchronization. As you can see here, two different threads, thread T1 and T2, can be calling get operations on the immutable map without having to have any explicit synchronization in the code. And finally, immutable collections returned by static factory methods are space efficient, since they consume much less memory than the mutable collections. Although immutable collections have some nice properties, they're not without their limitations. In particular, Java's immutable collections aren't very useful for many common programming tasks. There's clearly much more to programming than simply accessing read-only collections. You should therefore be very pragmatic when applying Java functional programming features in practice, including, but by no means limited to, immutable collections. We'll talk more about this in our upcoming lesson on the role of mutable state in modern Java programs. In this lesson, we'll demonstrate how applying shared mutable state in a parallel stream pipeline can be used to cache results and accelerate performance. Now that we've discussed the concepts associated with immutable objects in modern Java, let's show how to apply immutable objects to avoid shared mutable state. In particular, immutable objects help to eliminate shared mutable state in parallel pipelines. For example, the parallel stream factorial class shown here will be used to fix all the hazards with the buggy factorial example we examined in the previous part of this lesson. Once again, you can find this code in the EX2 project in the FP folder in my modern Java GitHub repository. The factorial method in the parallel stream factorial class functionally and correctly computes the nth factorial via a Java parallel stream. The first step in the factorial method implementation generates a stream of longs from 1 to n using the long stream range closed factor method. In this case, we choose a value of n to be 8 so we can visualize how the program behaves on the slide. We next call the parallel operation, which converts the sequential stream into a parallel stream. This has the effect of splitting the stream of longs into atomic sized chunks. Basically, we'd end up with the original range of longs from 1 to 8, first being split up into two chunks from 1 to 4 and 5 to 8, then into chunks from 1 to 2, 3 to 4, 5 to 6, 7 to 8, and so on, until the chunks become atomic sized and can't be split any further. 
The parallel operation also arranges to run these chunks using the common fork join pool, which has a pool of threads which are mapped to the underlying processor cores. So all the computations we see here will in fact run in parallel. The next step is to call the map to obj intermediate operation to convert the long primitive values into big integers, which of course are arbitrary precision integer values. The next phase of the parallel stream applies the reduced terminal operation. This terminal operation works in several steps. First, we use the big integer multiply method to pairwise compute new immutable big integer objects. For example, you can see here on the slide that the values 1 and 2 will be multiplied together to create 2, the values 3 and 4 will be multiplied together to create 12, the values 5 and 6 will be multiplied together to create 30, and the values 7 and 8 will be multiplied together to create 56. Each of those multiplications occurs sequentially, but they all run in parallel. So we end up with a set of computations that are taking place, creating those new values. The next phase in the reduction process is to merge two immutable objects together to create a new one. This takes place as the different threads finish working themselves sequentially and then have to reduce the results to provide combined values. So for example, you can see here that the results from multiplying 1 by 2 and 3 by 4 are then reduced to create a value 24. Likewise, we also see a reduction that takes the value 30 and 56 and reduces that by multiplying those values together to create 1680. And then finally, 24 and 1680 are reduced by being multiplied together to create the final value, 40,320. In this case, we're using immutable objects to create new immutable objects. It's very, very important that immutable objects be produced and used in this process in order to avoid chaos and insanity. And you can read more about the types of problems that occur by taking a look at the link at the bottom of the slide. So that's the end of our overview of the immutable object portion of key functional programming concepts and features found in modern Java.